Welcome to our weekly uh, Q&A with the family support team at the St. Louis Arc. I'm, Saint, I'm Sharon Spurlock. I'm the Senior Director of Family Education, and I'll be your host today. We've got an amazing panel who are going to be talking about the dignity of risk and why there are uh, often enough rewards that come along with taking a risk that it's important to kind of think through how can I make this risk as least risky as possible and, and take, take steps to be able to move forward. Without further ado, I have four amazing guests today. Uh, I'm gonna start with Christopher Worth and let him introduce himself and then we'll just go around the, around the room. Hey, Chris. Hi, um, I'm so glad to be here, Sharon. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, and I love being on here with Adeline too. My name is Chris Worth and I am a PhD student at the University of Missouri St. Louis. I love thinking about risk and I think of it as a as a tool that I've used throughout my life as a person with a developmental uh, uh, disability um, to grow my thinking. We're gonna talk about that um, today a little bit. Sharon? Thank you, Chris. Adeline, how about you? Will you introduce yourself? Hi, Adeline. Uh, we've already got people in the audience saying hello to you. And who's with you today, Adeline? Who's sitting next to you? Mom. Your mom? Mom, say hi. Hi, I'm Lisa Liss, Adeline's mom. And on the other side? Hi, um, we're all crowded around one screen, so apologies. I'm going to pop in and out. But I'm Hannah Satterwhite. I'm an individual and advocacy navigator with the family supports team at the ARC. Um, so yeah, I support families and individuals, teens and adults on advocacy related things and transition type supports. So yeah. Fantastic. So our, our uh, conversation today is about dignity of risk, and that's really about thinking about the things people are pursuing in their lives and how there's going to be some new experiences they're going to have along the way. And those may feel a little bit risky, but sometimes those experiences lead us where we want to go. So Chris is going to start off uh, by giving us both his unique experience as a researcher and also a person with a disability. So Chris, kind of help us get started with this. What is what is dignity of risk the dignity of risk is the uh is, is the a tool is a way of thinking which is used to, um to allow people with um uh intellectual and developmental disabilities to take risks that um that other neurotypical regularly ambulating people might um even not even realize they're taking dignity of risk says that um, everyone has the right to take risks and sometimes make mistakes within that risk and sometimes benefit um, from the risk without making a mistake, but also that the act of making a mistake can be a risk. I mean, excuse me, can be a benefit, right? Um, Dave Risk came about in the 1970s. This, uh, a researcher named Persky, he he um, had been a direct support person, and he saw that people who people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who were who were allowed to take risk grew. I mean, that seems like a a sort of um, uh, no brainer to us today, right? But back in the day. Um, it was hard for people to sometimes think of, um, sometimes we got extra bubble wrap it, extra bubble wrapped now as people with disabilities. Now, I think that that still happens today a little bit. So Persky's thinking is still kind of coming to fruition. So um, what I mean by that is that not everybody not everybody thinks of risk as something um, positive. In fact, much of the literature outside of Persky and a few others um, is kind of negative. But what we know is that the brain, that our minds literally grow, literally grow. I'm getting excited. 
from the idea of being able to take a risk, right? And the thing is, um, I think that a lot of um, service providers, sometimes they, they want to take uh, the safest route. Well, the safest route is, and this goes back to the literature as well, is not always very safe. Right, because people have to learn how to navigate their world. So Persky saw that when people were allowed to take risk, they um, they actually navigated that world in a much more broad way, in a much more, uh, and they grew their thinking and their community involvement. So. The big thing is it grows the mind. Our ability to take risk grows our thinking. It grows our mind, right? Um, and, you know, this idea that we have to, um, you know, risk is a certain type of riding your bicycle without your helmet, right? There are multiple types of risk, right? And the risk that we're talking about, or at least that I'm talking about, is the risk to interact with the world. Not always, um, it's not always as cut and dry as um, I'm going to get hurt or I'm, I'm going to stay safe, right? And I think that too often, um, um, and I'm probably preaching the choir in this virtual room, but too often we, we hold people with disabilities to those dualities, right? Um, finally, um, my team at the University of Missouri, St. Louis has developed a scale. And if you think, okay, I'd like to be able to take risk as a person with a disability, or I would like to support the person I support to take more risk, but I'm not quite sure how to do that. We have a paper and Sharon and her team are gonna send it out where we developed a scale that will allow you to think about risk and sort of incrementally um, present it, if that makes sense. Introduce it, there's the word. Um, Sharon? Yeah, I wanna follow up on, on the whole concept of riding a bike because you talked about uh, riding a bike without a helmet. And I think that um, that might be a risk that you don't need to take because there's very few reasons why you're gonna be able to move forward in your life if you don't wear a helmet versus wearing a helmet. However, I think sometimes people think riding a bike is the actual risk that they don't wanna take. So maybe talk about a scenario like that. How, if somebody could ride a bike and it could get them to their job or their friend's house to be independent or to a college class, Let's talk about that. What's the benefit of that risk? How do you use your scale to assess it? What do you see as some opportunities there, Chris? What I, what I can say is that, you know, um, that act of riding that bike with proper supports, drum roll please, that, that act of riding that bike with proper supports teaches a person to cross that street, right? teaches a person not to, you know, to sweat if they might fall, right? Right? I used to, I walked with a helmet on crutches and every walk that I took was risky, right? Because I fell a lot, but I had that helmet and I learned how to balance, right? I learned from even that fall, right? That's the, that's the scary piece. The act of taking that next step forward, understanding that we need a helmet, understanding that we need tools to, and for goodness sakes, we as a community of people with disabilities, we have more tools to help us take risk than most communities do, right? People think about this all the time, right? So use those tools. 
And it's the the act of crossing that street. It's the act of being independent. That is, that literally grows the brain, right? And it's scary, right? It's scary. We're, we're probably, you know, when I, I started walking for the first time when I was 11 on my own, and I felt a lot. Like I said, I was scared. The first time, the first time I went down a hill, I didn't tell anybody where I was going. Right, we lived. We're, I'm from West Virginia. My dad just about had a heart attack because he couldn't find me. Right, I had, and at one point on that very first walk, I rolled and had to figure out how to get up. Right, right. So, but I learned from that experience. And we've got one question that's come up um, and I have some things I'd love to say, but I wanna make sure I, I give you a chance to answer. Uh, we've got a, a guest that said, wow, Chris, you are so right about the bubble wrap comment. I feel like I have to be more protective as a parent of a child with autism though. So any comments for this parent? Well, I would, I would say, um, I hope, I, I bet you I know you, but... Um, <laughs> I would say there are tools out there. And many times it's, and don't strike me, don't strike me dead lightning. Many times it's the parent who's more afraid than the, than the, 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 than, than the, I almost said student, than their child, right? The thing is, you've got to, You've got to utilize those tools. You've got to um, start to normalize your own fear and talk about it. Yeah, and I think a couple of things. We've got a parent on today because parents' fears are based in a whole lot of experiences that they've had both as a younger person and as a parent. Um, so Lisa's going to comment on that. And I'll also say that this really, this, this presentation today is a kickoff for some seminars we're going to be offering in September. So we really want to give you as parents some tools to use to really think about what are the things that I'm afraid of. Are they real? Are they not real? How likely are they to happen? And if they, and if we are going to move forward, how can we really look at the helmets that are available to us? How do we make the risk as less uh, risky for this person to be able to move forward. So having said that, I'm going to shift to Adeline because Adeline and I took some time last week to make a short video where we talked about a risk that she and I both take. Um, she and I both at different times in our lives wanted to have the experience of joining a community choir. And um, it was risky for me because I'd never sang anywhere in my life and I didn't know if I could do it right. And I was told I was too loud and I was off pitch quite a bit. So I had to learn to tackle all of that stuff. Adeline had some of the same risks as me and she had some of her own things to consider. So I'm gonna share this video that we made together. And uh, then if Adeline wants to comment on, on it, she can do that. Today I'm here with my friend Adeline and we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the plans she made to go to a community chorus and how that impacted um, some supports we needed to put in place to minimize risk. So Addie, welcome. How are you today? Good. So we're gonna start off, I, I don't know if you remember, you started in choir in 2022 and we did a plan to talk about what would make a great life at chorus for you. And you said your good life at chorus was seeing friends, having dinner before rehearsal, getting rides to and from chorus. You wanted to sing and learn to be a better singer, perform for an audience. You wanted people to be nice to you and you wanted people to be your friend. Can you tell me about that? Tell us about Karis. I love Karis. You love Karis. What do you do when you're there? Sing. Sing, and have you made some good friends there? Yeah. All right. Are these still the things that are important to you? Yes. 
great. And then you also said some things you didn't want to have happen. You didn't want to be a bad singer. So you really wanted to make sure you sang well. You said Lisa could not come to Karis. Is that right? No. No, she can't be there. You didn't want to get in trouble. And you didn't want people to treat you like a baby. And I think that was important because when we did that first plan, people weren't always telling you what their expectations were for you because they didn't know that you could, could do everything as well as you could. So letting people know that you didn't want to be treated like a baby was important. So let's talk a little bit about um, how you got help at Chorus to, to get to those goals, to be on top of it. And I started off with your being a good singer, a good musician. Who are the people that support you to sing well and perform? Who is this guy on the left? Um, Stuart. Stuart. And who's he? Michaela. There's Michaela, and they're our directors, right? Mm -hmm. How do they help you be a better singer? Do they tell you when you need to sing certain notes loud and certain notes softly? Yeah. And do they tell all of us when we need to blend with each other better? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And then who is this on the right? Lola. Yeah, Loretta and Lolo. What does Lolo do to help you be a better singer? He bring out with other people. So she helps you to blend with other people? I noticed that you and Loretta have created some uh, cues. Like Loretta sometimes puts her hand on your back. What does that mean? To bring to point. When she puts her hand on your back, what does that mean about your singing? Do you need to sing uh, louder or more softly? Softly. Yeah, more softly. You talked about pointing. Was that with choreography? Yeah. And so she helps you with some of the choreography? Yeah. One of my favorite things that she did with you with choreography was we were all having some trouble because we had to clap on the exact right note this one time. And so Loretta got some gloves for you and two other people in the front row so that when you clapped, it wasn't too loud. So even if you clapped at the wrong time, it didn't affect the quality of the music. I thought that was so smart and it was a great idea for everybody to have that those gloves to wear. All right. Well, let's look at some other people that you get help from. Oh, my picture of Hannah still didn't come up there. So Hannah should be in this picture on the left. She's your ride home some days, isn't she? Yeah. How, how does Hannah know if she needs to give you a ride home? Do you yeah. ask her? Yeah. So sometimes you need to ask to get a ride home, right? Mm -hmm. Who else helps you with your rides? Colleen. Colleen and Lolo again. Yes. That's been great. And then um, who's this? Bridge. Bridge. And Bridge is the music librarian. What does Bridge do to help you? Turn it in. So you turn your music into Bridge and she keeps it at rehearsal, doesn't she? So you don't mm -hmm. need to remember to bring it every week. And then a big part of being in Karis was having friends. And you wanted people to socialize. Can you tell me about who some of the people are that you like to spend time with? Leslie. This is Leslie. Do you like to go visit Leslie during break? Yes. Yeah. Who else do you enjoy talking to? Uh, how about on the left here? Is that Erica? Erica. Erica. You know what I love about Erica is that she always wants to check in with you and say hello and find out how your week's going. And then you've got new friends, Zoe and Sterling, because they sat by you in rehearsal every week, didn't they? Mm -hmm. You guys talked a lot about our trip that we were going to go on to go to Gala, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it, who's this on the right? Mayo. Mel, you and Mel got pretty close on a vacation trip the choir took, didn't you? 
Yeah. Where are you guys here? Do you remember? I don't know. Uh, I do. You, it was one o'clock in the morning at a diner. You were out hanging out, celebrating our performance. Party girl. Mm -hmm. So now you've been in Karis for almost three years. So after you finished this last year, what were some of the things that were really exciting for you? Where are these pictures taken? Uh, Gayla. Gayla. What was Gayla? Music. Yeah, it was a big music festival, wasn't it? And did you, where did you have to go to go to Gayla? I need some support. You needed some support. You're right. Do you remember what city it was in? Minnesota. It was in Minnesota. It was in Minneapolis. So what kind of support did you get to be to be your best singer in Minneapolis? You said you needed support. I need help. Did you need some help getting around? Yeah. Yeah. So you had some people that would walk with you from place to place. Mm -hmm. Did you need some help getting ready for performances, like getting yourself your hair done and getting your makeup done? Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty cool to be there with all those singers. Do you feel like when you got to take that trip and you've spent two years with Karis that you've made some friends in the chorus? Yes. It's nice, isn't it, to know you've got your own friends. Uh, and you've already told us about some strategies that you've had to be a good singer and to be a good dancer when we've got choreography. So what's next? You told me when we started this call that there's some parties coming up. What's happening? Stuart party. Stuart's party. Stuart is leaving our chorus and we're going to have Michaela leading us now. So we're having a goodbye party for Stuart. And then tell me about the recruitment party. Do you like it when we recruit new members to sing? Mm -hmm. You help the membership committee a lot. You usually are very, they are, sit at the welcoming table and welcome new people and give them name tags, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And then we don't just sing our concerts. We sing some places in the community, too. So we've got a show coming up at the Muni, right? Mm-hmm. Tell us about singing at the Muni. What's that like? Singing my choir. Yeah. Is that good stuff? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And after we sing, do you get free tickets? Yeah. That pretty pretty much rocks. I think one of the things I've noticed most about you is that you are a, a more confident young adult. You are, are good about telling people when you need help. You are, initiate lots of conversations with people. You walk up to people and ask how they're doing. Um, you're very caring and you have good things to talk about with them. It's just fun to see you being more confident with all the singers. So that's all I wanted to ask. Do you want to tell anybody anything else? What's this picture? Me. Yep, there you are on the right. Where are we? Me, the Soda Choir. Yeah that's, yeah, that's the whole group that went. When we walked off the stage after our performance, did we get lots of applause and cheers? Yes. It was pretty cool. Anything else you want to tell people? I like choir. Yeah, you do like choir. Was it worth taking some risks so that you could be a member of Karis? Yes. I think it was too. We're going to finish this up now and give your mom a chance to say if she thinks it was worth taking the risk. I think she's going to agree too. Thank you, Adeline. You're welcome. Okay, that was our video. Adeline, anything you want to talk about related to Karis? Okay. Um, we have a question that says, how do we as parents convince other people in our kids' lives to get on board with letting them take risks, specifically job coaches and support people? Boy, is that a great question. Um, I, I think, Hannah, I don't know if you have anything you want to say about that. To me, it's about education, just like we think you all would benefit from some education to really think about this issue. I think we need to do that for direct support folks. Hannah, anything you'd like to add? 
For sure. Yeah. I love that question. Um, so for folks who don't know, I was a direct support professional before I was in this role mm -hmm. as a family navigator, and I still do a lot of direct support. Um, I think that a lot of the time as a direct support person supporting someone in the community or in their home or in a day program, you feel responsible for that person's safety and well-being, health, happiness, et cetera. So I think there can be a lot of pressure to almost prevent anything bad from happening. So sometimes DSP's minds are working over time. How do I make sure that, you know, they're not facing anything that's going to be scary or harmful in any way? So I do think it takes a lot of work to think about these types of topics and, um, you know, speak with coworkers, speak with um, your, your supervisors about how to um, work together to maybe come up with a plan for in case something really scary or dangerous were to happen. But at the same time, understanding that that person's choices to make risks, um, to take risks is can be really valuable and beneficial to their well-being and their happiness. So um, by preventing all risk, you could actually be really hindering their experience in their day-to-day -day life. Um, one thing I think about a lot is, you know, in a residential setting, things like enforcing bedtimes or something like that, choosing when some, oh, it's 9 p.m., time to go to bed. It's like someone may want to stay up till 11 or 11.30, but, you um, if a staff is like, okay, lights out, we're going to bed, you may feel like you are that person's caregiver slash parent in a way. Um, but if you're working with an adult, they are an adult. Um, they may have a totally different idea of what their desired um, evening might look like. So I think being open to having conversations and if something comes up that they want to do that you think could be dangerous, risky, et cetera, to have a conversation about how to mitigate that risk, but still give a chance to try something new. Yeah. And there could be no consequence or it could be a big consequence. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're exhausted to go to work the next day, or maybe they get in trouble because they don't do well, but we all face that. I have a question that's going to lead into you, Lisa. So then you're going to get the, the uh, front and front of the stage here. So our last question in the Q and A box is our, for a caregiver of someone with a disability, how can we not let our fears take over and take those risks? Is there a starting point or any trainings or <laughs> courses available to learn. So Lisa Liss. Well, um, I, I quickly wanted to tag on to what Hannah said. And I do feel like having everybody who works with Adeline understand the big picture and, and what she wants out of her life and what the vision is, which we've been sharing since she was a toddler, um, get, tends to get people on board because I think they think they know what we want what she wants, um, but but they don't until you share it. Um, yeah. So that that's that. I, I um, think that's so important. We don't want you to just take risks to be risky. Risks are there because they come with the pursuit of the goal that you have. And I think that's a great point. Thank you. Um, and then to the question, I think that, um, well, we took the um, seminar through the ARC called Joy's and I'm not sure it's still called that, to kind of start to think about, um, think about risk, think about what we were afraid of, why were we afraid of it? Um, and just realizing that some of the things we were afraid of, she didn't even care about. So we didn't need to be afraid of it because that was not something that was important to her. And, and just coming to the realization that um, it's not like all of a sudden you have to take the, the seatbelt off and Go for it, Adeline, see how you do. It's tiny, tiny little steps and it's putting in all of those bumpers along the way and having um, and knowing that there are other people who are out there to support and and in you know her life. And and it is scary. It is scary. And um, you know, Sharon's heard me say this. Lots of people at the Oracle have heard me say this, you know. I have to just say. If she's not going to die, I guess I'll <laughs> do my best. Um, and we we have a you know we use technology, we use lots of things to kind of to kind of set our minds at ease. Um, 
So talk and there a are little things about- that don't happen, you know, I mean, there are things that we're not willing to take a chance with. Yeah. So I, I think you've got to make uh, calculated decisions. Lisa, talk a little bit since Adeline used the example of Karis, when she first started to go there, um, what were some of the things that you had to let go of um, to get you to the point where you could let her get on a plane and go to another city for a 7,000 person convention? You didn't just start there. Um, well, I will say it was definitely baby steps. Um, the, the first, I would say the first maybe month, six weeks or maybe longer, I sat in the church outside the room where choir was just in case. Then, then I sat in the parking lot. <laughs> then you pushed me to say, you live a mile and a half from here. Let's start working on Adeline finding her own ride, which she wanted to do, you know? So then that was a learning curve for her. And it was me sitting at home with Life360, like, okay, it got over 10 minutes ago. Why is she not on the road, you know? So, and then just kind of working through that stuff. And then it was me learning to trust that it wasn't just you. It There were so many people at Karis and nobody was going to, leave her be the last person at the church. I mean, it somebody was, it was all gonna work out. There are plenty of people who are willing to support her. Um, and honestly, I would say six months, eight months into it, by the end of that first season, for sure, um, I wasn't driving or bringing her home or worrying while she was there. I knew that she was taken care of having a great time, feeling like part of the community, which is the is the most important piece. She doesn't go there, and she can answer this, and feel like she's got a bunch of babysitters. And that's important to us and to her, I think. She's going there and having a genuine experience. Um, mm-hmm. I tell everybody, it's the way the world should work. Yeah. I mean, it's such a great example of inclusion, but it, like you said, it didn't just happen. <laughs> Adeline, why is why is it that your mom it doesn't come to choir? Because um um why do you come to choir? <laughs> well, is it okay with you if she comes to Kara's? Yes. Oh, oh. Yay, I'm joining. <laughs> she usually says you're a terrible singer, mom. You can't come. <laughs> she doesn't want me to do anything with her. And that's this is all her stuff like everywhere she goes it's her stuff she doesn't want me tagging along um so we've got a question that i think is a really good kind of all skate so anybody that wants to jump on this just raise your hand and we'll take turns um somebody said tell me about those bumpers how can we protect while allowing independence so you know lisa you talked about technology and relationships i immediately thought of the integrated support star how do we think through when somebody needs to take some some steps that might have some risks involved. What are some ways to do that? Um, Well, I would say that for me, anytime I start thinking about a risk, I think about the worst case scenario. And then I kind of tick things off as I can, you know, Um, like I referenced Life360. She's got a phone. I can track when she's on her way home from choir or anywhere, really. I mean, she goes out plenty without us, you know, so that's, that gives me a level of comfort. She knows how to call me or grandma or whoever, um, if there is a problem. Um, so I would say that, you know, right there, just kind of thinking through each risk and what, what kinds of things could we do to mitigate that risk or, you know, realize that she might have a problem, you know, she might forget to ask somebody for a ride home and then she might see pe- everybody starting to leave and she might think to herself, oh, I better hurry up and get a ride. I think in a perfect world, we would also start to remove some bumpers for folks. So no bumper should be a constant if if possible. I mean, that is my opinion. And sec- secondly, you know, I fall all the time at home. Right. And I don't have, you know, my wife isn't here a lot and I work from home. So I have to build 
a lot of my own, I have to tell myself not to be afraid, to be alone, right? Even me, right, Mr. Risk, uh, friendly guy, right? I, um, I have to remind myself that I also have natural supports out there. I've called Hannah. I've called, well, you know, you, Sharon, before. You know what I mean? Like, the thing is, yeah, um, you just have to sometimes say, this could happen, right? The worst thing could happen. Critter, mm -hmm. could, critter could sit on me and not get up for an hour. The thing is, right, like, you, if you live like that, you're not going to grow. In the, and I mean that internally. I don't just mean our feelings. You're not going to grow your capacities. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. Sharon, I'm sorry if I got preachy. No, I bring you on because you're such a good preacher. Go um, it's all good. Yeah, I think you're right. I think for me, it's kind of twofold. It's the... Uh, really examining what is the potential risk, which I think is where Lisa started and kind of really acknowledging for yourself, is this, what's the reality of this likely to happen? You know, I am very afraid of riding a bike in the city because I know so many people that have been hit riding a bike in the city. And for me, I don't have, like, it's not for me the way to get to work. So it's not, a worthwhile risk for me. However, I feel like I can take the risk to ride a bike and I will fall on my bike. Uh, if I get on a trail and I put on a helmet and I ride with a partner and all those kinds of things. So I think, you know, figuring out what, why are you afraid and is it a real thing? And then putting some steps in place are, and, and start small. Maybe I'm not going to ride the bike for 10 hours. Maybe I'm going to go, you know, a mile and see how it went. Um, maybe Addie's mom's gonna sit in the parking lot at church and let her be downstairs with a bunch of people that that she feels pretty good about and see how it goes also you know um, as part of my dissertation i'm looking at um how much actually happens that we're afraid of in the world mm -hmm. yeah, statistically most things will not happen to you Right, right. I mean, I mean, you know, even the the scariest things, and it's shocking um, to think about, right? How much, yeah. as long as you're not, as long as you're, as long as you have those supports, you're going to be fine. Yeah. Chris, while you're uh, unmuted, um, your friend Dominic's throwing you a really good question, so I'm going to send it your way. Uh, Dominic wants to know the difference between dependence and interdependence, um, oh. because he thinks the word independence can sometimes be misunderstood, and we all get mixed up with it. I love the thought of interdependence versus dependence, so bring it. So interdependence is that act of knowing that you're connected to others right knowing that you're connected to others and not only um um that not only recognizing that connection but understanding that um as as a friend as a colleague you're giving to them more than um a, a, a and and they are receiving from you and you're getting from them something uh, in a, in a reciprocal kind of way while a, well, you know, I think that we we teach we train this this idea in our community about independence, and really, the the wolf runs with a wolf pack most successfully, right? I can't believe that came out successfully, Hannah. <laughs> um, but I I think that we don't think about that as humans. We are meant to be connected. I need Hannah. And she needs me, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yes, it does. It's like I need Adeline, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and I'm just going to comment on that from a different role, being a member of the community chorus. I think we learned really quickly which 
things that we could do better that would benefit everyone in the chorus because Adeline was there. And so it created that better universal space. This welcome party that we're having next Tuesday for people that might want to be new singers. It used to be a very loud, very chaotic kind of space with people running back and forth. And people started to acknowledge their neurodiversity, their anxiety around that kind of a social event. So now we've got a little mapped out um, stations kind of thing where people can choose their own adventure to come in and see what this experience in this choir is like. And it meets a lot more people's needs than it previously did. Um, and I think a lot of the things that, that we've made available to Adeline have been important to other people. And people will say, when we started talking about going to gala, I I remember people saying, oh, it won't be the same if Adeline doesn't go. So there was a immediate buy-in that she needed to be there as a member of the chorus. And, and that's when you know you've kind of achieved that interdependence. She has a role there. They expect her to be there. She's our cheerleader. You know, we laugh because her energy is so much higher than everybody else's. So it's, it's cool for her to be there. Um, plus, like a chorus doesn't sing well when they're not singing together everybody might be singing at a different pitch right or i don't know anything about chorus but <laughs> the idea is that you're doing it together yeah if, if you're making magic as a community and that mm -hmm. has to happen in a shared way yeah yeah. Um, I'm going to go back to this question. I'm not sure who wants to jump on this, but it's it's a really interesting kind of a, and it's not really a pushback, but I'll, I'll just ask. So at what point do you think parents of children with disabilities put up those bumpers? Are we guided to do that by doctors, special education staff? We may not even realize we're doing it because it's a norm within this population, but where is the drive from and coming from to put up those bumpers? Uh, I'll start and I'll say no one ever, Adeline's whole life, service provider, teacher, nobody ever told us it would be a good idea to let her take chances. It was the opposite. Um, and it really and truly was not until Joyzen for sure a, a little before that I had gone to some other, you know, seminars, um, but that we really started thinking about it and, you know, we are not going to live forever and there needs to be more than just us that can help her. And this is not even what she wants. Like if you, if you ask her, do you, you know, you want us to go with you here, there, or anywhere, the answer is always no way. Um, so that's where, that's where it started. It, it needs to start. I mean, I'm a helicopter parent for both my children. <laughs> I think, I think my other one is less independent than Adeline, but, um, you know, like when they're, when they're tiny is when it needs to start, you know, I have a quick comment too, on that question. Um, I think sometimes the families expect that their doctor, their teacher, um, their case manager, anyone at a, at, you know, at any point in a kind of helping profession will know everything, like will know the correct answer automatically. And um, you have to remember too, that those folks don't know your loved one as well as they know themselves and as well as you as a family understand what their life has looked like up to this point. So um, while those people can be sometimes resources, they may not have the whole vision um, of where you're going. I've heard a lot of families come to Family Navigation who have said, oh, my, our teacher said this. And it's not that people are wrong. They're just kind of describing what they may have seen in, in other situations and it may not apply to you. So I would just get a, um, get, you know, if you're looking yeah. for opinions, get several. And um, yeah. I don't know how old the person who asked this question's loved one is, but start today. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I have, and my husband and I have both kind of beaten ourselves up over what could it be like now if we had started sooner? Because yeah. it's not an overnight 
thing. It's, yeah. It, it's yeah, I think the first really good story I heard about this, and, and, and the reason I'm bringing this up is I think that, that the most important thing any family can do, and you may not have done it in this way, Lisa, but uh, clarifying your vision for what you want for the future helps the professionals in the room to understand which decisions are going to get you there. And I remember hearing this story about a family that went in and talked about what they expected for their young child and, and then applied it to the idea of riding on the, the segregated bus and how taking a special bus to school wasn't going to get them to those goals that they wanted. So I think for any family to be able to say, articulate, what do you want for your child in terms, and I know young families say, we don't know, but, but you do, you know, that you want them to have friends in your, their lives. You know, that you want them to have a productive uh, place in the world where they feel like they're giving something. You can articulate a vision that's very broad for a young child, and then take that vision to your meetings with professionals and say, how is what you can offer my child going to help us get to this place? And that's what these webinars are, these seminars, and they're going to be face-to-face webinars um, we're going to be doing in September. Um, they are really all part of the joys and curriculum that Lisa referenced, but we're doing them in bite-sized chunks and they're called caregiving to advising, which is how we frame this conversation, that you are moving from being a caregiver for your family member. You still care about them. You still are going to protect them from real danger, but you're going to step to the side and let them step up a little bit and take ownership of their own lives. So those set sessions will be on Thursday evenings in September, and we'll send you some information about those. I think we may have another question. Well, somebody said that response made them cry. So I guess your work is done, Lisa. Well done. Um, awesome. Can I add something super quick, too, for the families of younger children as yeah. well? I feel like, um, you know, when when families are attending IEP meetings, a lot of the time they think, okay, will the parents or the caregivers will go and they'll meet with the teachers and the team. And it might disrupt their child's day to come out of class to join the IEP meeting. But I just want to plug that it is super, super valuable to have them participate in some way in, in any and all meetings about them um, at any point. So they could be a very young child and, and, you know, I love that you guys do that. I've attended some meetings with you all where Adeline is in the room and is lead, helping to lead the conversation. She used to deliver cookies when she would, yeah. like, in kindergarten, we would bring cookies and she would pass them around and we would put her eight by 10 glossy up mm -hmm. in the middle of the table because you're yeah. having a meeting with people that only know your child on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And and to be honest, a lot of our, you know, people that we take care of don't necessarily look great on paper. And so it's hard for those people to visualize what you're saying when you're saying, I want my child to grow up and move out of my house and have a job. And, and they're thinking, no way. So to just continue to sit, we're talking about a real person here and share. Adeline, do you have a job? Yes. Where do you work? Not a neighbor. Novel neighbor. Novel neighbor. Yeah. That's one of your jobs. Where else? Avery. Avery School. Avery School. Do you get paid? Yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, possibilities are there. Uh, Chris has got his hand up. I'm going to say we've got five minutes left. So Chris, you're good to go now, and then we're going to walk through, and anybody that's got something they just want to say, you're going to get a chance to say it. I'm, I'm a person who never got to go to my IEP, right? I mean, I'm in my 40s, right? I had I had a diagnosis that said that I would never achieve, right? Never, right? And I know it's easy for us to, um, to forget that because I'm wearing such cute glasses and looking so good, but, but there was a time when people didn't have any expectation that I would interact with the world. And my parents took that as, gospel, even my adopted parents, right? So it's important to understand that you have to write your own gospel, right? Um, 
and if you don't, um, and it can be informed by, it can be informed by the experts, but the experts aren't always the experts. The Gospel of Chris, it's a good one. Uh, Hannah, what would you like to say to close out? Um, I think just as a final thought, you know, any any participation in creating your own world is only going to build those self-advocacy skills. So just start small and in a few years, it may be um, that vision may grow quite a bit. So just if you're scared to start doing this, just start. And I'm going to market Hannah. If your family member is at that age where they don't want to talk to you about their goals and dreams and aspirations, they can sign up to do navigation with Hannah a couple times and put together their plan and, and maybe have something to come back to the kitchen table too. So thanks, Hannah. Adeline, is there anything you'd like to tell people before we get off? I like Harris. Yeah. You like Harris? <laughs> what else? Um, Harris people um, uh, making me I like um, my friend Gabriella. Yeah. It's nice to have friends all over town, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I thank you for making that movie with me. I appreciate it. How about you, Lisa? Um, I think I would just say that, um, and plugging the Charting the Life course, which I'm sure most people on here have probably heard of, mm -hmm. um, I would recommend just sitting down and filling out a trajectory and what you want your loved one's good life to be. And and if your child is old enough, and I don't think they need to be, as long as they can you know, show you pictures or what I have an opinion, um, they should fill it out too, because we did that in middle school and realized that our good life for Adeline and Adeline's good life for Adeline were not the same. And so we literally changed everything we were working towards at that point, because um, we, we were headed in a, the wrong direction. And that good life can help you write, write a vision that you can share in a meeting or just hand out that good life and say, hey, this is what we want for our loved one. And it's hard for, it's hard for teachers and service providers to, to fight on that because they can't say, no, sorry, you can't have that. Well, and usually they don't want to fight about it. I think we get into those confrontational spaces about, I want 30 more minutes of speech therapy. And really what we need to say is we all agree that this is the direction this person's going to go. What type of speech services and communication ed training is going to benefit them to get to this place? And maybe it's 30 more minutes of speech therapy. Maybe it's a new tech device. So I think that's the good conversation to have with all the people that believe in the same vision so um so as usual i get to have the final word um and if you aren't familiar with charting the life course every month i do an introduction to charting the life course uh class which is super fun it's only one hour um it has been attended regularly now by self-advocates families um service coordinators and professionals all in the same space which is really really great um and and leads to some great conversation. So feel free to, to join me. Thanks, everybody. And thank you, Chris, Lisa, and Adeline and Hannah. What a great conversation today.